In 2009, Judith Butler called for new bodily ontology, one that rethinks issues such as precariousness, vulnerability, and exposure. Bodies are crafted through their situation historically and socially, she argues, in systems of power that make some bodies more vulnerable and less grievable than others. In this paper, I survey eclectic strands of evidence for physical and structural violence within the Iron and Viking Age house and how this may relate to multimodal personhood. Power is not a thing that is held or owned by particular people. It is a product of relationships. Once relationships with others, both people and things, open up particular possibilities for action while others are foreclosed. Brock and Fontaine argue. That reminds me of the Norwegian sociologist Johan Galtung's definition of structural violence, which is violence as the cause of the difference between the potential and the actual, between what could have been and what is. Architectural spaces and domestic practices help to enact social and political realities of grievability and structural violence in the Iron and Viking Ages, I argue. The view of domestic activity as ahistorical and apolitical, inferior to other fields of action, has rightly been critiqued as ethnocentric, androcentric, and capitalist. The conventional understanding of Iron and Viking Age societies, as demonstrated here, is a socially complex emergent kingdoms based on raiding, control over trade, and driven by competitive individualism. And this, of course, entails an androcentric preoccupation with warfare and other assumed male spheres and activities. It also includes assumptions of bounded individuals as active subjects, with the warrior chief, who we've already encountered today, <laughs> as the hegemonic ideal and the agent of historical change. Additionally, personhood and social identity is to some extent treated as static and stereotypical where individuals can be slotted into doxic categories, warriors, traders, housewives, etc. Feminist critique has a long history in Scandinavian archaeology and includes invaluable contributions to scholarship. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet, in my view, there are still challenges in gender archaeology of the first millennium. To some extent, Feminist scholars have been eager to showcase, for instance, the significant position of Viking Age elite women, particularly widows, who could take over the male roles of running the farm. Parts of the field have seen the new ADNA analysis of women buried with weapons, that is, the female Viking warriors, as evidence of a gender equal society. This is problematic because it still upholds stereotypical male values as hegemonic. Moreover, these readings still entail a static and essentialist view of personhood, and intersectional perspectives have been few and far between. Indeed, there's a huge unaddressed issue with representativity. More or less all research on gender is based on furnished burials and later medieval written sources, meaning that we're building our entire understanding of gender systems of personhood and power on fractions of the population. It has been tentatively estimated that in the Viking Age, as much as half of the population did not receive burial in a way that we can recognize archaeologically today. In recent years, new works have engaged critically with the heterogeneous composition of longhouses from the Iron and Viking Ages, and these houses as perpetual collaborations among materials, people, objects, and animals. However, what we perhaps haven't addressed enough is the fundamental inequality and distinction in who was recognized as human or as a person. Carol Clover has shown that the Norse written sources uphold the divide between able-bodied men and exceptional women, reflected in the old Norse term magi, those who are able, breadwinners. And you magi, those that cannot maintain themselves, including elderly, children, people with deceased, unable bodies, dependents, etc. Her research indicates that this fundamental distinction is a binary that runs deeper than the gender system and is very much tied in with insults and concepts such as being argir or blauder, cowardly, effeminate, 
or the passive person in sexual intercourse. One of the possible Umagi populations that have received little or limited attention are children. And this is some work I've done uh, where throughout the first millennium, infants and children were rarely but repeatedly deposited in wetlands and particularly in settlements in Scandinavia and in Northern Europe in general. A small minority of these children display osteological or archaeological indications of having suffered a violent death. And it should be noted that infanticide was legal and socially acceptable in the Iron and Viking Ages. And it was still legal after the conversion to Christianity if the child was disabled. Infants were not necessarily grievable persons, and especially if they were of low status or unable. While in the majority of cases, we do not know the cause of death for these deposited children, we know that this was a highly selective practice and that the spatial patterning of children links them intimately with and physically fuses them into the materiality of the house and its immediate surroundings. Indeed, the spatial patterning of infants mirrored the deposition of selected artifacts in constructional elements, which I've argued is likely not a coincidence. So while these bodies were perhaps not grievable as persons or human beings, they seem valued as powerful artifacts or animate objects, treated in similar ways to other objects chosen for deposition. And I'll just note that not only children's bodies are incorporated into the larger collaborative entity of the house, so are a wider array of body objects, including skulls, worked human bone, and other selected body parts. And the question is, are these bodies necessarily grievable and commemorated, as sometimes assumed in the literature? Or are they bodies taken apart as objects when needed in ritual practice? <coughs> the World Health Organization reports that overall 30% of women today experience physical or sexual assault from an intimate partner. If a woman is killed anywhere in the world, the far most likely killer is her spouse. What do we know, if anything, about violence against women in the Iron and Viking Ages? Three Viking women famously had the right to divorce, and the medieval law codes uh, just cite physical abuse as grounds for divorce. However, the actual provision only specifies violence if it's executed at least three times at a feast. That is in the public sphere. The Icelandic law Grogos says that both parties have right to divorce if their partner gives them large wounds, generally defined as wounds that penetrated the brain, body cavities, or marrow. And the laws say nothing about abuse in private or of less grave character. A recent study of five Swedish burial sites show that the trauma rates for women and men are approximately the same, with the exception of one site, where the trauma rates or fractures for women were much higher. Um, I have no idea whether or not these uh, fractures are the result of, of interpersonal violence, uh, but it's interesting that the men's injuries are consistently discussed as injuries from warrior training or fighting, while women's trauma is explained as accidents. This is Kjellström's study from Birka, Viking town in Sweden. Uh, she showed that the men died younger, no, the women died younger than the men and had significantly poorer health overall. And it is likely, even though it's a relatively small sample of 69, that girls were given less nutritious food or suffered more malnutrition in childhood than boys. Such a clear difference and differentiated treat treatment in the household is both physical and structural violence. So we clearly cannot exclude that both men and women may have been physically abused or subjected to structural violence, especially if of young age and especially if subordinate in the household. And the reverse, of course, we cannot exclude that women's injuries may also be the result of warrior training or active fighting. Moreover, even though we all know what the Vikings did, we hardly ever take on the full consequences of the fact that these were slave-based societies. 
in the sense that they distinguished persons who had no or very limited legal rights. For example, to kill a slave was not punishable by law. You had to compensate the owner. No. Stefan Brink writes, Stefan Brink writes that certain thralls could be appreciated advisors and administrators, while others were purely work slaves, socially, economically, and judicially equal to animals. I think we need to open for the possibility that the individuals with very restricted legal rights and perhaps limited prison <coughs> were at risk of violence at almost all times perhaps particularly female slaves, as we have clear contemporary sources of sexual exploitation of slaves' bodies. And why is this never a part of talking about gender systems and gender in the Viking Age? Why are these women's experience not considered? So what kind of bodies were grievable? <coughs> One way of making people different from one another in physical space is by ordering their bodies and their movements. In Viking houses, this was materialized, among other things, in the high seat, the seat of power for the household leaders to display their bodies to elevate their position. Odin, king of the gods, who may or may not be depicted in this miniature here, <laughs> is also part of a social reality where some people could transform between animal and human form. This is not only something we hear about the gods, but also the protagonist of the sagas. Elite persons could also have a filge, an animal spirit or familiar, that they could at times transform into. So not only in the mythological realm, but also on the ground, some bodies had extraordinary capacities. They were dressed and adorned and spatially ordered in specific ways. They were, const they were constituted as special through a bundle of materials and actions, such as feasting, moving along specific spatial trajectories, body adornment, and high seats. Possibly the very elite personhood is embedded in the hall buildings themselves. By curating and extending the lives of the halls, the legitimacy and the person of the rulers was also extended. Some houses and halls are at abandonment treated as human bodies. They are burnt and buried. And I've argued elsewhere that in some cases, the hall and the leader seem to some extent to be the same. And of course, there's a lot of work currently going on into the idea of living swords as elite persons. Swords in the written sources can have personal names and they can be intentionally bent, broken or destroyed at burial. So there's a question whether these are grievable bodies, hall buildings and swords. Like Brais argued that Inca imperial vessels materially created and enacted the concept of king, I argue that the hall building in particular materially created and enacted the chieftain, who effectively becomes a representative of Odin in his high seat, in a meshwork of power, performance, and architectural space. But it's important to note that Odin, the king of the gods, was also seen as Argir or Blauder. He would take an a feminine role through a particular magical practice called Silent, which has led some to ask whether Odin was in fact queer. And then we're left with a number of potentially less grievable bodies, more precarious lives, slaves, subordinates, some children, some women, unable bodies, and males who are effeminate. We need to acknowledge houses as social machines, as spaces of politics and social production that have profound consequences for all other aspects of life, and where both dominant and subaltern ontologies are molded. In and through the first millennium house, some bodies had the potential to transform into birds or bees, while other bodies and body parts were used as amulets. Some people's bodies were property owned by others. Some bodies may have been animate things. A paradox emerges when I try to understand power and inequality and violence in these households. Because I, well, I agree with what Rachel was saying. I don't think we should see power as something that is universally held by the exceptional male and then wielded over children or women or marginalized populations. And yet in my material, some bodies seem to consistently be articulated as more precarious and less grievable. 
And while the last thing I want to do is to cast some groups as victimized across time and space, I don't think that upholding, for example, an ideal of the strong Viking woman based on a fraction of the population is particularly helpful either. And it's clearly worth noting that the exceptional male in this context is not a Western delimited individual engaging solely in strategic military action and maximizing his profit. The elite male can transform into an animal, has a person sword as a companion, and shares personhood with his house. So concepts of personhood and the body are significantly more complex than conventionally assumed. Thus, when working on a period that has such a significant history of being politicized and romanticized, we are in dire need of looking beyond the articulations of doxic and assumed categories of persons and beings based on the elites and fundamentally projecting Western modern concepts of personhood onto the past. I argue we need disruptive problematizing research along several different lines. We all know Alberti's evocative and compelling argument for doing archeologies span of risk and wonder, but to take people's ontological commitments seriously can and should at times not only be wonderful, but deeply uncomfortable. So I think we need to explore how Iron and Viking Age everyday practices, objects and architectures helped enact political systems and produce bodies, whether human or non-human, of significantly different subjectivities, desires and potentials. And recognize that obviously, in this often glorified historical period, someone always pays the price. Thank you.